Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Canadian actor Fred Iwanek. I do want to start off by saying thank you for doing this. I know there was some uh, back and forth there for a while, and with everything going on in the world, it sort of slowed down here. So right. thank you very much for even sitting down and doing this. So greatly appreciate. Oh no, my my pl- thanks for having me. I um I didn't um yeah I appreciate you doing that. It felt weird. I always feel weird talking about myself or just even talking to be honest. Well, but um yeah, it was such a be- weird weird time. It, you seem to enjoy it. I, I as since we have when we got the official date of when we were going to do this, I, 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 I searched through all old interviews with you of you talking, oh all old podcast of you. So I had yeah. questions all prepared, and then you had already answered all of them. So I was like, okay, how am I going to start this podcast? Oh no! Oh. But I usually started with the same question to everyone: Where did your sense to entertain people come from? Oh God! Um, <laughs> well. Okay. I, so this is a good question. I don't, I don't really know. I've been asked this before and I don't know where it comes from. I, I think there's probably a lot of reasons. Some of it's probably ego. I don't really like being the center of attention, but I kind of like being the center of attention without being overly the center of attention. Like I don't, I don't like to, um, I don't like to fish for that. I don't want to like sort of fight to be the center of attention, but when somehow it just falls in my lap and Oh, I'm the center of attention. Uh, I don't mind it so much as, as long as it's kind of comfy and natural. But, um, Were you the center of attention growing up? No, I had a group of friends uh, that were like ridiculously funny and I just kind of hung around. I was like kind of the Ed McMahon of the group. I would just sit and laugh at all their funny stuff. And I yeah, went Orson Graves who, who was like a wizard with poetry, like funny poetry and um, Steve Sogo and Dave Dwayter and these guys that were just like, Wit, like super witty with the comebacks like we, we weren't like the most popular group like we were kind of we weren't outcasts I and mean, we had pretty small schools so everybody ended up at the same parties kind of thing but we definitely weren't the jocks or the cool kids and so whenever somebody tried to you know come in with a snide comment those guys were just like super quick with the wit and they could kind of fight them with words we couldn't fight with fists but they could fight with words which was pretty uh, amazing i'm always amazed by people that have, have that sort of um that, that, that wit. And I've worked with a few that, that just blows me. Sometimes you don't even laugh. You're just like, Oh, how did you even come up with that? Brent Butts, a guy like that, Mary Walsh, just people like that just blow me away. And, and for, Oh, but to get back, I didn't mean that I, I got off track. Yeah. But it, Cause one of the things that I think it was, was I, I, like I was never witty funny, but I was goofy funny, like fart noise funny and stuff. And it, and, and it was, I think where it started to take hold was in grade eight. Uh, I think it was a survival technique. I was so scared of getting locked in my locker or getting like, you know, markered on my face that uh, I'd, I'd make the, the big guys giggle and, uh, and it kind of saved me. <laughs> I think that's where it, it came from. It was that from. defense mechanism, right? It was, yeah. You don't want to get picked on. <laughs> yeah, it was a defense mechanism. I, 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 that's one of them anyway. And then I, I had to take electives. Uh, you know, when I was going to school, I, I imagine they still, I haven't, I've been so far from school. I don't know what they have to do now, but yet, and one of them was, I thought it would be easy. And it, I was a really shy kid and it was terrified, you know? So I ended up taking acting because I thought, oh, you know, it just goof around for an hour, you know, every week, but it was, it was, it wasn't bad at all. It was I found every excuse to get out of the, the, the plays and out of pure fear. And during this time, are you playing hockey? Because I know hockey has been a passion of yours for, for almost your whole life from what I, from what I can gather. So were you playing hockey during this time as well? I was, yeah, I was playing hockey and lacrosse. Um, I started in, in peewee, which I would have been, well, I know I started playing because Richard Berder took the Canucks to the finals in 82. So I would have been 10 or 11. That's when I want, I was like, mom, I want to be a goalie. I want to be a Richard Berder. So that's when I started playing hockey. And then a couple of years after that, I started playing lacrosse out of a dare. A friend of mine uh, dared me to play. Uh, and that's a terrifying sport. <laughs> but I ended, up falling in love. <laughs> yeah, I ended up falling in love with it, which is crazy because I was a timid little kid. I was tiny too. I took some beatings. But I don't know what it was. Kept going back. 
Well, it, it, it's one of those sports that it can it can scare the crap out of you the moment you get on that field when you see that that mallet of a ball coming at your face. Well, it, yeah, and so in, in hockey, I played goal, but in lacrosse, I played out. And the thing about lacrosse, I think as long as you're not going around there running, you know, running your mouth off and being a complete idiot, then the, the game, the game is, it's honest with you. But as soon as you start throwing in little cheap shots and stuff here and there or say something to a guy, he's like, all right. And then you, you feel the wrath of the game, right? Like there's, it, it seems to back then box lacrosse is what I played. I didn't play field. So it was a bit, um, yeah, it was like, you know, did you, keep did your you ever up. think about playing competitively? Like potentially going um, off because every hockey player's dream, because I played for 10 years, I was not a good player to begin with. I, yeah. I basically did not know how to stop. The board stopped me. Did you ever think <laughs> I could potentially go into the NHL? No, no. I, there's never any doubt in my mind. I was never good enough. Like I, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't have much confidence in myself uh, growing up. I loved playing. I was, I was fear, uh, scared every time I got on the ice, but I, the adrenaline, I don't know. So once you're, you're in it, you just kind of, it takes, it takes over. Um, but I was, I'm not a very smart kid. Like I, I, I'm just smart to, smart enough to realize I'm not that smart. And in hockey, I just, I, I was smart enough to realize that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go anywhere. Um, but I love playing and you know, you know, so I, I just kept playing lacrosse. I actually got drafted by, um, the cool little mad max in the, the old W well, the WLA is still around, but back then it was like the highest level you could go. And I got, I got drafted in, I think the 11th round. So there wasn't much chance of me, <laughs> you know, sticking in the lineup, but I, that's sort of like my highest accomplishment in sports was getting drafted by the cool little mad max. But even to get drafted, like not even no kids get, not all the kids get drafted. So even just to get drafted, you can hold that, like put that on a banister somewhere on your tombstone. I got drafted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, sure. Sure. Yeah. Let's, let's play it up. But I know anybody that knows me knows that the only reason I got drafted probably was the general manager was my old coach my old junior lacrosse coach and the coach at the time was my old midget coach. So I think they were just throwing me out. Oh, let's, you know, we got to throw these. We got to, I don't know what to do with this pick. You know what? Let's give it to Freddie. Let's get Freddie. <laughs> that was probably how it went down. But um, yeah. So you decided, so sports wasn't going to be for me. 11th round pick in the lacrosse. Yeah. <laughs> not going to be in the future for Fred. So no. you decide, okay. And I've heard this story a few times. You go, drive truck free with your grandfather or go into acting. So you decide I'm going to go into acting because that seems like the better suit. Yeah. Well, I still kind of, you know, I, I sort of fell into it to a certain point. And then I, at some point when I, when I turned 30, I had to make a decision with my life and I said, all right, I'm going to go after acting. But before that I spent like the majority of my twenties, you know, working here and there. Uh, I went through, theater school at Douglas college, but I got asked to leave. Um, and I begged them not to, to me, you know, I was like, well, do I have to leave? And they're like, no, I was like, oh, well, then I'll stick around, I guess. Cause I don't know how you tell your parents you got asked to leave theater school. Um, but I, I was there because my parents wanted me to go to college and they didn't really care what I took. I mean, I, I think they did, but they wanted me to take something that I wanted to take. And I honestly couldn't think of anything. And I was good at goofing around. Somebody said, Oh, you should, you know, apply for the theater program. So I did and I got in, but I, I just wasn't in the, I wasn't mature enough to, to really go for it. I didn't know what I wanted. The theater school is a weird thing. If anybody's done theater school, they know it's kind of like you wake up at seven in the morning and, and they're asking you to, to you know, okay, well, you're, you're, you're a starfish. Okay. And you're like, oh, come on. It's like seven in the morning here. Um, so and I, half I didn't the time you're so, drunk, right? Because everyone's yeah. hung over the night before. Well, the, the problem is that, yeah, and I, Douglas College literally across the street was a Rosie O'Grady's. And I spent more time at Rosie O'Grady's than I did at the, the, in the theater program. But um, I, something, about, something about being there did click because I, I, I found out that I did like performing. Like I, I, I did like it. I was still too nervous and too shy um, to really go for it. Uh, but because of that, I ended up working at Science World. And because I had theater on my, my resume, <laughs> I didn't tell them I didn't finish the program. I was like, no, Everyone lies on there. their resume. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I ended up working at uh, 
um, science world out here doing um, a lot of their science shows. So I was a, I was a terrible I was a terrible actor, and I didn't know anything about science. Uh, and but I don't know, like through that, <laughs> um, a couple of the guys I worked with were taking a theater a class with this woman named Shay Hampton, and so I went and audited the class, and something about it just stuck the way she presented it. I don't know. It just, it kind of clicked and I, I actually really enjoyed her class and they just kind of like, you're sorry. in downtown Vancouver at this time, the heart of sort of television central for Canada with all the American shows coming up, doing their shows in Vancouver for their tax breaks. You're an actor an up and coming actor. Were you going to audition after audition just to see what is out there? Or were you waiting for someone to come to you with your manager, talent agent? Uh, oh no, I was, yeah, you're nobody, you're doing the grind. So I was just whatever, like my, you know, started off like a lot of people in Vancouver at the time doing commercial auditions. Like, you know, that's your, that's what you're doing. Like in my first year as a working actor, it was literally just commercials. That's all I was getting and getting a chance at. And then, you know, slowly you get little, uh, auditions for, you know, they, you know, one line here, one line there. And, and then the casting director, you know, that way, that's how I worked my way up anyway, locally. Uh, and one of the shows that you started out on is one of my favorites. And I watched it religiously growing up was Da Vinci's inquest. You got oh, a yeah. part on that show. That must've been huge because you're a new actor. You, you're sort of trying to get your footing into the door and yet here's this show that's reputable across Canada and you get into that, uh, production yeah that was it was a huge deal I was really that was what, like the first sort of and it wasn't like a big role I actually played two characters in two different seasons they brought me back as a different guy which was great I was the teddy bear guy in the first one and then this like Ruzo or something some yards guy that finds a dead body you know so kind of those like they were day player roles right but they were for me they were like the chunkiest roles I I'd gotten and uh working with Ian Tracy and Donnelly Rhodes in, in the first episode, the first character that I played. And then um, to, get, to get to play with, with Nick in, in, the, in the second was, was un- unbelievable. Yeah, it was a big deal for me. It was huge. Yeah. Now, are you like every other actor who gets their first bi- like big sort of Showtime uh, CBC role and gets the family around the television to watch the sh- that episode when it comes out that night? No. No, or did no, I, you try no, to keep no. it as secret as possible? Yeah, I, 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 I don't like, uh, I don't like, I feel like I'm being braggy. I don't know what it is. I don't know. And, and to be honest, I hate watching myself. I, I, uh, it never goes the way I think it's going in my head. When I'm in the moment on set, I'm like, oh, I'm knocking it out of the park. This is fantastic. And whenever I watch it, I'm like, oh, wow, that was just nowhere near what I thought it was. <laughs> That's terrible. I don't know how I get work half the time when I watch my stuff. But um, no, I'm kind of, I don't know if, I keep saying shy. I don't know if shy is the right work. I, my mom gets, my mom still gets mad at me. She, I'll get calls from her and, you know, she's find out, found out something I've done from one of her friends and, and she's always embarrassed that I didn't, and I'm like, oh, I forgot. Sorry, mom. And she's like, she's like, I got to hear it from Barb next door that you do, you did this thing. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I didn't really think about it. <laughs> Well, I find, and, and we've only chatted for 17 minutes now, but you like when you talk to actors sometimes, they have a huge ego of how they're going to portray themselves. They're always going to make sure that they're the center of attention. When it comes to you, you're okay taking a back seat and saying, okay, I, I did it. It's my job, and I'll just walk away and go to the next thing now. Uh, thanks. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, I don't know. Like, I... I, I I, I, I'm, I know, I'm actually in a weird spot right now because I, I honestly, I don't believe I'm really cut out for this business. Like I, I, I love everything. I, I was having a conversation a couple of weeks ago, actually with a, a, somebody I've worked with over the years and, and I figured it out. It's like, I love everything between action and cut. And then I'm not really cut out for everything else. Like uh, I hate self promotion. I, I always feel weird doing it. Um, you know, even when we got to do junkets for, um, for, for like say corner gas or something, uh, you know, you're given all these talking points and everything. And, and 
And I, I'm just like, ah, you know, if somebody asks me, I, I feel weird pushing people into my talking points. You know, if somebody asks me something, right, I don't answer that. Like, so I'm not, I'm not really good at it. Um, so you know, I will I give you a topic that you'd love to talk about from every okay. conversation I've heard about you. Um, right. The delicate art of parking. This is a okay, show. See, this, this, yeah, yeah. this is a movie that you say you loved. It is the highlight of your career so far. Would you say that is correct? Yeah, that's yeah. It's the thing I think I'm most proud of. And when I watch, it's the character most unlike myself that I like. When I watch it, I'm. And I remember being there, like, I, I, I you know, I, I work hard in everything I do. Like, I'm, I always try to be prepared and, 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 and be the best I can be and, and, and be true to every character I play. But that one, yeah, I can watch that and go, yeah, I, you know, job, job well done. Like, I don't mind patting myself on the back for that one. That was, and then it wasn't just me being good. It was like the whole picture, everything about it all. Uh, all the actors involved, Trent Carlson, the, the writer director was fantastic. Um, it was just a great experience. A lot of that was shot guerrilla style. Like uh, the camera would be like two blocks away just because they were trying to get that, the, the look of the, have you seen it? Have you seen the whole film yes. by any chance? Yes, I yeah, have. It was, it's, it's one of the, like, I, I'm, I'm not proud of just the work I did on the show, but I'm proud of the, the show. Like it was this little Canadian Vancouver film that outperformed Hellboy in Vancouver. Like, you know, like Hellboy. That's, that's insane. Like, it, it opened the same weekend as Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind at uh, Fifth Avenue in Vancouver, which is like an art house cinema. But it bumped that movie out of the big cinema at the big theater at Fifth Avenue. Like, that, that's incredible. You know, so it, how does it feel it, to well beat deserved. Jim Carrey then? Like, because Jim Carrey <laughs> is a massive actor and here's your little like movie that you are so proud of. And it's bumping his movie out of the big theater. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's You know, it's, I, I wish I bet him 50 bucks, you know, to see, <laughs> Hey man, who do you think film's going to do better in Vancouver? 50 bucks. Like, how, you know, um, him and Ron Perlman, you guys could have had this whole bet going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could have been, uh, see, uh, I don't think, um, yeah, geez, I'm not, I'm not that smart. Um, so did you no, know, know it was going to be a success when you got the script? No, 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 I, I, no, I had no idea. I mean, I, I knew, I knew it was good. I felt like it was good anyway. I felt like, you know, I mean, there's so many factors. Like I, I what we were doing on the day, you know, on set with Trent and all the other actors, I felt it was really good. Like, it, you know, you obviously can't see outside yourself, but it felt really good. And then, and then it's out of your hands, right? Like editing's going to put its stamp on, uh, the director is going to put its uh, stamp on in the cut. Like so many things are going to add to it or maybe subtract from, you don't know, like how the end, end product's going to be, right? Like just, it's not, that's why, um, I was going to go on a, an awards tangent there, but I'm not going to do that. Um, Cause it's not just what, well, cause it's not just one thing, like, you know, performance and I'm learning this is, and it's, it's really, um, in, in voice work, it's, it's really uh, clear to me. It's not just your performance that creates the performance. There's so many hands in it. Um, and that's true in, in regular acting, like the, the camera, how the camera is portraying you is, is adding or to, to the performance, the, the influence from the director is adding to your performance. What you're getting from your other actors is that the writing's adding to the, like, it's, it's really not just the acting. So, um, Oh, I went off on a weird sort of spell there and I've forgotten what we were talking about. We were talking about just how, how it came about. Did you know that it was going to be so popular? Oh, because yeah. It seems that, um, it, while it is an indie film, like it was not a high budget film to be produced and edited and shot. It has created a lasting impression in the Canadian lexicon of com uh, comedy indie films out there. Oh, that's, has it? That's good. Uh, that's <laughs> good. Um, yeah, no, yeah, I had no idea. And actually, if I'm being honest, the perception was that it wasn't going to do anything. Like it would just go to the festivals and, you know, that's sort of what you expect when back then, anyway, when you did a indie Canadian film was, okay, it's going to do the festivals and, you know, hopefully it'll win some awards and, you know, I got something for my reel, right? Like that's kind of what you think is going to happen. Um, and, so and yeah. That, after that movie, you go, you do the t a junket tour in the, I'm assuming you, uh, go, go to Montreal for the Montreal film festival for the premiere. No, the I didn't, I didn't go. You didn't go. No, there, there was no, um, 
There was no budget to I get the actors there? Well, it it might have been. You know, I can't remember why I wasn't there if it was. But if I was asked, I would have gone for sure. Um, but I imagine it would have been budget. I think they blew the budget on promoting in Vancouver. Because <laughs> it opened up same time in Toronto against Troy. I think Troy, uh, that Brad Pitt version of Troy. And, of course, they didn't have money to promote it. I'm not saying that it would have beat Troy, too. I'm not trying to get all high and mighty here. But, uh, you know, I think they blew the budget. But it was smartly, too, because I, I imagine they made their money back. Um, but I don't know for sure. But, but, no, so I didn't travel with it. Um, I know I went to a few other uh, festivals as well, but um, I, didn't get to, I didn't get to travel with it. After that movie came out, like literally after that movie came out, you go off to Saskatchewan to, to perform in yet again, another staple of Canadian comedy now, but a upstart film, uh, a TV show called Corner Gas. Uh, this is a, every Canadian actor's dream is to get on a TV show. Was this a massive success to be a lead actor in a TV show for your, for uh, your career? Oh yeah. I, this was, I didn't, I didn't consider myself a lead. I considered myself a, like a regular character, like a, an everyday character, right? You know, Brent's the lead and then, you know, I play his best friend. So, uh, so at the time I didn't consider myself a lead, but I, I guess essentially, you know, we're an ensemble. So we were kind of, um, but yeah, regular gig was huge. Uh, absolutely. Um, but that's, just, I think if you asked any of the, the cast, they would tell you after that first year, we kind of thought that was it. At, at the same time, the Canadian television wasn't there. Things weren't, you know, there are very few things that kept going. Um, you know, I think the average view, I think if you were pulling 400,000 viewers at the time, that was like considered a hit at the time. So, you know, we, we just sort of, the understanding was uh, CTV had to spend some money on Canadian content. So they said, here, go do a season of this and kind of left Brent and the crew to their own to just shoot it. And we could, you know, thought, Oh, great. This was, this is going to be a fun summer. And, and when we were done, it was like, nice knowing you. And um, we, we were very wrong. So is that why you picked up rubs and arms as well at the same time? Because 2004, Corner Gas comes out, 2005 Robs and Arms comes out, and you and your uh, co-star on Corner Gas, Gabrielle, decide to both do this second show at the exact same time. So is that why? Because you didn't know if it was going to be picked up? Uh, no. I, I, well, one, I did it because you take, take work when you can get it. Like, e- even though Corner Gas was a huge success, it's, we're, you're, we're not making friends money, right? So you gotta, yeah. you got you to gotta keep it going. Um, and, and I, same thing, even though, um, you know, I was on a show, you're still expected to work the, work the grind, right? Like you, you, you know, it wasn't like offers were, you know, flowing. It wasn't like the phone was ringing off the hook. I still had to go out there and pedal work. And, um, I actually got that audition. I didn't get the part, but I got that audition because, uh, Louise Clark, who is the executive in charge, one of the executives in charge of, uh, at CTV in charge of corner gas was also, uh, one of the executive network executives working Robs and arms. And, um, the first round of casting I, I had, I wasn't, um, I wasn't, uh, thought of, and she, I guess they were having trouble fi- finding that, that character. And, and so she suggested me to come in and read for it. So I have to thank Louise Clark. I have to buy, actually, I never bought her a beer for that. That's shame on me. I should make sure I get her a beer, but, um, so I, I simply took that, uh, well, not simply. I mean, it was a great role. I really enjoyed it. Um, met some great friends on that. Um, but I took it because I, you know, you got to take the work when it's there. But at some point you must think to yourself, okay, I've got an established show here with Corner Gas. We don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, I'm doing these other potential side jobs right now, but is there a point in this, the six years that corner gas is on that you say I can slow down now. I don't need to be rushing. I don't need to be working 24 seven, seven days a week. Or even during those six years, you were hustling and bustling and trying to find the next job because you didn't know when it would be potentially over. Yeah. We never knew every year of corner gas we go into, uh, we wouldn't know, by the time we finished shooting, we still wouldn't know whether we were coming back. So we would have to wait pretty much while it's running before we found out. I think we'd usually find out 
just before the upfronts, which I think were in June, and we would be done shooting the September before, right? So we were waiting all those months to find out if you have a job. So you go home and, you know, you can't sit on your laurels because, and by no means am I complaining, but we weren't making enough to just, you know, roll the dice, you know, well, if we don't get it, then, then I'll go back. You know, you're like, you get home and your agents are already like, Oh, here, you got an audition here, here, here for this and this and this. And they, and if I'm being completely honest, they weren't great. They weren't always great auditions. They were a lot like, you know, cat woman shooting in town and there's a character like security guard number five. And they'd like you to read for that. And I'm not over exaggerating. Like those are like what we're coming on the table. So you're like, okay, wow. you know, let's go. And then it was around season five, you know, going into season five, I'd say where I started really kind of getting tired of the grind and saying like, started saying no to auditions, not saying no to roles, but it's like, look, I, I, I don't want to go out for security guard number one anymore. I don't want to, you know, not that I wouldn't take the role if it was offered for me, but um, I was just getting tired of the grind. And well, Which I, is know, understandable just, because you're five years in, Corner Gas is a massive show across Canada. People are tuning in every, to every week when it's on. And I'm assuming people are starting to know who you are at this time, right? They are stopping you on the street and saying, hey, you're this person from Rops and Arms. Hey, you're this person's from Corner Gas. So there must be a point in time when you say, okay, people are starting to know who I am. And security guard number four might not be the best role for someone in my stature. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> I, that's what you like to think right you know you yeah. hope that yeah. you've, you've worked a certain amount and I at that point yeah I felt like I've paid my dues right like I've done all those roles I I worked my way up for corner gas doing a whole bunch of those kind of roles like pizza delivery guy and you know uh, the but the reality and I know it's a little better in Ontario, like in Toronto, there's a lot more, back then anyway, there was a lot more Canadian stuff being produced out there. Not so much in Vancouver, a little bit, but not nearly as much. So it was very, and it still is very much um, a service oriented industry out here. It, it, we service Hollywood, right? And so the reality of, uh, although Corner Gas was, um, had a, a great fan base and was pulling great numbers in Canada, n not, not very many people in BC. It wasn't big in BC. Number one, a lot of the, the, the directors and, and shows coming up here didn't have much knowledge of it. And I don't, I don't even really think that many of the casting directors here paid much attention to it. This is just a thought. So I was, there wasn't much, there wasn't much to like, I always joke if somebody would ask me what my rate was, I'd be like, I think it's scale minus 15%. Because, <laughs> like, you know, like that seemed to be a lot of the, you know, it's like, oh, you know, they're, they're asking about you and they're asking if you're willing to take scale minus. I was like, ah, oh, you know, geez. <laughs> you know, I, I, got, I, I always joke like, because I, I felt like my ego would always get knocked down if I ever was ever getting a little high. Um, one, one year at the Leo's, do you know who Ben Ratner is by any chance? He, he's a writer, director, um, actor, um, indie guy, great, fantastic writer, director. You just look him up. He's got some in, cool indie film stuff that he's done over the years. Uh, I'm, and I'm sitting beside him at the Leo awards, which is, um, the local, uh, entertainment awards. Yeah. And I was presenting and they, they introduced me, now, given this, it wasn't on the night of the awards. It was during the dress rehearsal. But they they, they call me up as Jeff Eunuch. And, and, and I'm looking at it, and I, I, I turn to Ben, and I go, that's an unfortunate name. And he, he goes, as a joke, he goes, I think they mean you. And I was like, nah. And no one's going up there. So I put up my hand, and I go, do you mean Fred Awanek? And they look at their hand and go, yeah. And I was like, ah, oh, you know. And Ben goes, geez, you're only on the number one show in Canada. I was like, yeah, I don't know. You know, what are you going to do? So it didn't really seem to make a difference. The, 
you know, not in my world anyway. I didn't see it every once in a while. Actually, I get recognized in Vancouver more now uh, than I did when the show was going on. I think in reruns, maybe it's reaching more people, maybe. Well, um, I can, in an I odd can way. S- like CTV comedy, they've rebranded Comedy Central or whatever comedy was beforehand. Like Corner Gas is on, it seems, every weekend, and it's on for like five hours straight, and it's just like bombarded. It is, hey, watch this. And I think people watch it because I can tell you, I watch it every Saturday and Sunday when I wake up because I turn it on and I'll still laugh at jokes because I didn't see the last episode or I didn't like, I missed something laughing the last time I watched it. So people are okay. still getting in that, re- in that repeat, right? Well, yeah, I mean, that's good. It's, and it's, it, you know, it's been a godsend. Uh, it's, it's, it's allowed me to pay the bills. Like here we are almost 20 years on and I'm, you know, what there's it's like a new version of it and I'm still able to pay the bills, which is fantastic. Um, now the one show I want to talk about, and this is the one that I like, I, I, I fell in love with the character. I, I enjoyed the show. I was disappointed when it got took not taken off in season two. Dan for mayor as a political, oh, wow. as a political nerd, it was my like go-to uh, show. How did that show come about? If you don't mind me asking. Um, well, I don't, it, so it was a brainchild of three. So, so Kevin White, Mark Farrell and, and Paul Mather were all at one point, um, the showrunner for Corn and Gas. Different points. Mark Farrell was the first, and then Paul came on, I think, to take over from Mark. I may be getting this wrong. And then Kevin, if I'm correct, was took over for Paul. Um, and they were all writers at the same time. They were all, at the beginning, I think they were all writers, and then eventually, like, took over showrunning at different points. I can't remember what seasons. And I don't know when they got together, but and I don't know whose initial idea it was, and but they came up with this idea and it wasn't until going into season six that they approached me. Uh, and again, I think, I think it was uh, Louise Clark that was kind of championing me maybe, or she definitely was in my court pushing me um, to take on that role. I still had to read. Um, I had the screen test for the network, but I don't think they were seeing anybody else. At least that's what I was told, but they still wanted to screen test, I guess, to see if I could be different than Hank. Um, and luckily they, they thought I was, uh, so I don't know when they initially sort of created the idea, but I, I don't know how long I'd been in the work with those guys, but I know they, they, they'd been working on it for a bit, definitely in season five of corner gas In season six, I guess when they knew corner gas was going to end is when uh, I got wind of it. Did you enjoy your time on that show? Because it seemed like from, from a viewer's perspective, it seemed like you enjoyed yourself. Oh, I did. Yeah. I, I have, I have some regrets. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I did have a lot of fun and that cast was like a, just a solid group of people. Um, and you had some amazing guests, uh, st- uh, like, uh, guest stars come on the show, mayor of Toronto, mayor of Vancouver, all these different mayors who want, like, that must've been interesting to have, uh, like play off of those characters. Yeah, it was, I, I, I mean, it, oh God, I wish it was coming out now. It would be so much more, <laughs> uh, relevant. Um, or at least when, you know, maybe waited when, when, uh, Doug Ford was not, uh, sorry, Rob, Rob Ford. Ford. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, coming out. Uh, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, it, 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 I, I, I wish I could do it again. And I, and I, I wish that we got m- more than two seasons. I feel like if we were given an, a, a serious opportunity and I, I don't, I don't know whose fault it was. I don't know if anybody's fault. Like at the time the network was being sold and I think that kind of hurt us. And, um, and the format changed, right? Because season one, it seemed to be yeah. a story arc where season two, seem to be standalone show episodes. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not going to speculate on whose reason. And I know, so I'll say this. I thought season two was funnier. Like I thought it was definitely, there was more laughs, but I, I loved season one. Like I loved that idea of, you know, to s- simplify it, a, f- a funny soap opera, right? Like I, I felt like that. And if they really pushed that, especially if it came up now, you know, 
2020, but I feel like that's the kind of show people really get into now. Something at the end of every episode, you got like, I want to stream like that, that concept, the format would have just been great for streaming. Well, I everyone's think. bringing back old shows. So I think we should start a <laughs> Twitter hashtag, bring back Dan for mayor. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I go for it. I'm not going to stop you, but I, I, you know, I don't like your chances to be honest. <laughs> you I heard it here show. first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and again, I loved working for those guys, uh, Kevin, Mark and Paul and, and Sue, Sue, the, the producer out there in Toronto and, and the cast, like, Paul and Mary and Ben and, and everybody was, I don't know. It, I, I, I kind of, I, I'm not, I'm not putting it on my shoulders. I, I, I did the best they could at the time and hindsight's 2020, but I, I it, it's, it's kind of the, the show I have the most regret of. I, I, I wish I could go back. It's like high school. I wish I could go <laughs> back knowing what I know now. Like, I, I feel like I, I could have changed up a I few see, things and tweaked well, a few things. He, he, here's the thing about me is like, I, I come in, I have my vision for the character, how I see things, but then I always, it's like the director's show, right? In in television, it's the, it's the showrunner show or the the executive producer on set. It's their gig. And, and so I I come in, I do what I want. And if they tell me to do it a different way, okay, I do it a different way because it's, it's their gig. Right. And I, 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 if there was ever a show where I wish I was more of a, a bit of an a-hole. I don't know. Like kind of stood up for myself a bit. Maybe it was that. Not that I didn't think that w- what they were doing was good, but I think I could have added more, you know, not okay. that I think I would have been, my ideas were better than what they were telling me to do, but I think. Just if wish I you put, would have spoke up yeah, a little if bit I, more if, often. I, if I spoke up a little bit more, if I pushed back sometimes at the right times, I think I could have added more. And, now I've got and, to ask uh, the question then, do you do that with Brent? <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. Well, listen, like I, you know, here's the thing with corner gas. It, it, and this will sound like a negative, but it's not like corner gas, especially when we we're doing a live action show, they were very, not strict, strict's the wrong word, but you know, they wouldn't not let you add stuff to it, but they really wanted you to do it the way it was written. Right. So it was always like, Hey, can I do this? Absolutely. But can we first do it? a couple of times the way it's written and then you can try that. Right. And so it wasn't like we were like not allowed to add to it, but they were, you know, they had a very defined image of what they wanted. Like an MC it's all coming, you know, Brent's image, uh, a vision, I should say, not image. And when the show comes out of the gate, like a huge success and never dipped its entire run, what's your argument? Right. Like, like, no, I think I know how this guy, you know, it should be, and it, this came on early in my, my career. Right. And so going back to Shay Hampton, and this is going to sound a little cheesy, but you're, you're as an actor, you think of yourself as an instrument that plays the words that, that are given to you. Right. And so you be as open as you can, uh, to, to allow that to happen. And so, so I was like, this is my job. This is what I'm supposed to do. So I'm, I don't want to get in the way of it. Um, but I, so I never, I never feel that way. Like I just, it just sits well with me. Hank's the character of Hank, especially just sits well. Like I, there's nothing I would really do different that, than what Brent presents. So now, there's no I, reason. I, I've been trying to find this out and I, uh, uh, I, I want to get the, it from your, yourself. But was it hard to come back to the show after Janet had passed away? Um, or did well, you want to do it? Because I know Corrine has done an amazing job as Emily Roy, but the idea of potentially recasting that, was it hard for the group to get back together and do the show or no? Well, I can't speak for anybody else. I mean, it, well, I could say yes. I think everybody felt definitely felt... So we, we actually did a short um, teaser for it. I guess it was to show the network how the, the animation would work. And uh, Janet was involved in that part. So Janet was actually involved in that teaser part. And then it was, she passed on after, excuse me, after the show uh, got greenlit. So, 
so th- th- they were obviously in a tough spot. The, the show, it wasn't a matter of like, um, Janet passed away and they're like, now let's, now they decided to do the, yeah, it was already in the process. So yeah. It, yeah. And, um, so it was, it was hard in the sense that, um, this is, this is, this is really, this is kind of a downer. Sorry. <laughs> I just, I, no, no, it's, I, it's I, good. I, I, I mean, always wanted to I, know. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's because Kareem's doing such a, a fantastic job. And I think what made, what made it easier. And I talked to Bruce about this because Bruce is, is uh, Janet's husband, Bruce. Um, and maybe you've heard this, I'm sure maybe you've heard this, uh, but he actually presented Kareem to Brenton and David and Virginia, the, uh, yeah. as, a, as, a, as an option, they were really good friends. They knew each other through the theater world. And so there's kind of a nice transition there, you know, like it's, it's been handed off. It feels like to somebody worthy, uh, Corinne, when we did our first record, Corinne was part of the Toronto crew. So I was, I was sitting in the Vancouver studio beside Brent in between Brent and Nancy and, uh, Lauren and, uh, Gabe were there. And when Corinne had her first lines, we don't, we don't see her. We could just hear her voice. I looked, I looked to Nancy and she looked to me and we just, both our jaws dropped because you're just getting the voice at that time of like, it is very surreal. It's like, yeah. Well, it's surreal to even hear it uh, as a viewer because it sounds so much like her and she's done an amazing job over the last two seasons. Yeah. Yes. Like it's, so, it, and it, I guess, it, we'll go ahead. Well, I guess, and I'm just, you know, selfishly to kind of not feel any kind of guilt about it is knowing that, you know, the feeling is that Janet is, is probably pretty, pretty still that her friend Corinne sort of carrying on. I think it was some, somebody that Janet thought was a complete, you know, CFA, uh, that it it would be like, this isn't good. (laughs) But just knowing that it's somebody that loves Janet and you know, Janet loved her. It, it makes it okay. You know, that's good. Um, so I, I'm going to put you on a little bit of a press junket here. Uh, oh. <laughs> we are we are launching season three of Corner Gas Animated here at the yeah. it it like literally two weeks from now. We're recording at the end of October. Uh, Thanksgiving is the first episode. Are you like was this a harder season to record because of all the COVID nineteen restrictions? Um. Yeah, we so the COVID stuff happened about halfway through. So we were business as nor, you know, usual. And then then we had a scheduled hiatus. Uh, I think it was for the writers to catch up. Um, and so we were coming back uh, in early spring. And when we were scheduled to come back is when stuff really started to go down, right? So we had to take a bit of a, a, a breather. And it was pretty surreal because I, you know, I've, yeah, I don't know where you stand, but I, I've, I've bought in. I believe there's an actual virus and <laughs> I believe I, need I had it. <laughs> you did. I, okay. I was, oh. I, I'm a stat, I'm a statistic in Alberta that I was one of the ones that got the gut darn thing. Oh, well, I was going to say good, but I don't mean good, but I mean, <laughs> you know, I, it, it I don't know how people can deny it. Like I understand you look in your everyday life and go, I don't know anybody who's got it. I don't see what the big deal is. And, and you know, I, so now you're the third person that I'm aware of personally that has had it. Um, I'm not I can super tell close. you best diet in the world. You oh, lose God. so much weight within those first two weeks. I, oh. I laugh at it now. It's not joke, but it's the only way that I was able to get through it. And do you have any, like, are you, are you have any residual effects now or are you clear? Uh, there's days that there are, there's hard to breathe, but like, that's just because a lot of the smoke in the air right now with all the wildfires oh, down in the States right. coming up this way. So not, yeah. nothing too bad. Like it's pretty, it was, I got a mild case of it. So it wasn't like, Oh God, everything's gonna, I have to go to the hospital, but getting a nose swab three times was not fun. 
So. Oh gosh. Well, I've, I've been tested a couple times, but like, luckily it was the, the shallow swab. Like they didn't have to go all the way. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, Oh, well, I'm glad you're, you're better. Thank God. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, and you know, there you go, people. There's another example that it's out there. Um, but so I, I was really nervous to go in, but I mean, thankfully animation, uh, voice recording is the perfect form of work. Cause we, you know, they could isolate, I was isolated in my own booth. Um, and the, you know, the people in Toronto, same thing. So you'd get to talk with a few people and then they patched all the things together it was before we got to be in the same room and it was kind of like doing a radio play. So that was the only difference was sometimes like, Oh, okay. We got this scene. You know, Oh, Hey, uh, Brent, can you read Lauren's lines? Cause he's not here. And Fred, can you read, you know, Corinne's line? She's not here. You know, so you kind of patch it together to get flow going. Um, but it, you know, it works, it actually works fantastic. So it's, you feel totally safe and, and everything. And, um, so it, it works out pretty good, but you know, it's not ideal, but it works. Are you enjoying doing the animation part of the the new corner gas, the the new version of this corner gas that uh, people have come to love? Yeah, I love I love every bit of it. You know, we were talking earlier. Like, I wish I, this is what I would like to do. I, if I could just do animation work, I'd do it. This would be my if this could be my everyday gig, and you know, knock on wood, it has been. I hope maybe we'll get do the Simpsons 20 years of corn and gas. Like, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to force it on anybody, but I, you know, I, then you I, might I, finally I, make friends money. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, maybe if it runs a hundred years, I might get there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you have I, started branching into the animated series because you did dino trucks as well. Yeah, that was, this is, so this is what I was going to get into. Like I, um, dino trucks, happened before corner gas animated and um it was i just love every bit of it i even everything i i don't enjoy doing about you know i guess live action i actually quite enjoy in animation world like if, for instance the audition process um for animation is exactly like the job you're you're trying out for right like it's a it's the job so it's you're going in and it's it's if it's, it's, it makes sense. It's like, yeah. Whereas when you're auditioning for television and film, you're going into a room and there's somebody that's face is buried in a script and there's people on the couch that are kind of like, you know, as you walk in, they're still on their computer and you know, it's like, okay, yeah. So, Oh, oh Hey, hey oh, yeah. And so you're, you know, you're, there's an alien coming out of your gut. Right. And uh, this, they come in and they've, they're offering you a, a coffee, but you got this alien. So, uh, and then that's when you see your line. Okay, go anytime you want. Like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, ah, you know, this is nothing like the job. Like, this is crazy. Like on the day you'll actually have some prosthetic thing coming out. I don't know. It's always kind of weird. Plus at the same so, time, as a voice actor, you don't have to go in dressed up, right? You can just go in your pajamas half the time because they're not looking for what you're going to look like. They just want to know what you sound like, right? Yeah. And you know, everyone jokes about that, but it's, I think it's unprofessional if I actually <laughs> did show up in my pajamas, but like, you know, people can't see us, but we're doing the zoom. Like I, I haven't shaved. I got my baseball cap on, you know, that, that's the voice. Gig. As long as you're presentable, you know, exactly. Yeah. Like I'm wearing pants, everyone. Don't worry. Like it's all good. I'm assuming <laughs> Fred is as well. I am. Yeah, I can prove there's my, my knee. There you go. You can see it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Nothing um, crazy going on here. Uh, the last area that I want to talk about before we wrap up is a new venture for you, a YouTube series that you've started here. Uh, <laughs> Stack the pad, Kirk Lemur. <laughs> yeah. Where did this come from? Uh, this came from, <laughs> I, don't, I, I was, a buddy of mine was over and we were, we were goofing around, uh, you know, making jokes and he, he was doing a web series uh, called Michelle's. Andrew Barber is his name, which I think is brilliant. I think they only did two seasons. Colin Mockery has a little cameo in it. He has a cameo uh, in everything, remember? I know he does. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Wicked guy. I, I, I've worked with him a couple of times now. He's such a fantastic guy. Oh, um, and, and, like, I'm not kidding. Like, he's just a fantastic human being. Super funny. Really tall. Intimidatingly tall. Uh, really? <laughs> 
Yeah, he is. Like, he's well, I guess it gets Ryan Styles on every, whose line is everyone yeah. short. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm I'm five nine on a good day, so I, I'm I'm like the run, no matter what room I go into. But um, anyway, I got off topic. So uh, Andrew Barber. And so I was just going on and on about his his uh, how much I loved his uh, his web series Michelle's and and he was over and he was getting into goaltending. So he was coming over because I had some spare sticks and a few other bits of equipment that, you know, I was kind of handing down to him and, and we were sitting there, he's taping the stick. I'm showing how to take the goal stick and we're, and I was like, Oh, I always had this idea about this goalie coach, you know, character. And he's like, Oh, my buddy's got a you know, similar idea. And so he hooked us up and we came up with it. And his idea was more doing kind of like a, a like a short, like a one-off. And I was like, I was like, no, I, what, you know, what if it was more, what if we created this sort of, um, this Instagram character or YouTube guy who's peddling his DVDs, like buy my DVD guy, you know, like, like, a, you know, and uh, that's where it kind of spawns. It was a combination of these two guys. Uh, I had a different name. I can't remember. And his name, he said his name right away. And I was like, Oh, that's perfect. Kirk Klimmer. And, um, are we expecting more is. episodes? Because I know you stopped well, there a few months ago with uh, COVID I'm assuming, but is yeah, we did. More? And it, it's been tricky getting ice time and um, we both got busy for a bit and, you know, it's not a money maker by any means. It's something we're just doing for fun for shits and giggles. Is like, Oh, am I allowed to, sorry. Am I allowed to say, Oh that? no, yeah, we, we, we've had politicians drink beer. We've had politicians like oh, yeah. smoke marijuana on our show. Go oh, for wow. it. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. If this is a little later in the day, I would have had a wobbly pop for sure. Um, but uh, it's purely for fun. I think it's for my own entertainment um, and we both want to do more and we're planning on it. It's actually funny. We were just texting the other day. He texted me podcast question mark. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. Stack the pads with Kirk Lamar. But now it's got me thinking, I don't know. Everybody else has got a podcast. No disrespect. I mean, this is a solid pod. I meant to say like, you know, I feel, I feel bad. I feel like I'm bringing the curve of your, 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 your podcast down here, the caliber of your podcast. But you got like Kim Campbell on here and, you know, people of, rep, you know, <laughs> of, of, you know, reputable. Uh, res- okay. You know, but I will on, like, say those are the ones that said yes. The people who said no is the bigger like list. Like that is the, <laughs> like, oh, okay. So these are the people like it, most of these interviews that I've done is because of COVID and everyone wants to talk right now due to COVID. Oh, really? <laughs> so they, because they <laughs> well, can't go anywhere. Co- I'm more surprised. It's like, uh, you know, oh, you, you want to talk to me? Sure. All right. You know. You're, it's your, you're, I was going to say it's your 10 cents, but I'm, yeah, I'm not getting paid, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> uh, I can I, send just, you 10 cents if you no, want. No, no, no. Come on, come on, come on. I'm just, uh, no, but, um, but to be honest, and like, I don't, well, don't, like you are caliber to me because I grew up watching your shows. Uh, oh, now, my now grandfather you're me feel loved old, the huh? show and pardon me. Now you're making me feel old. You grew up well, watching. Here's the thing. I'm five years younger than you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So growing I up feel is- that way too. I, I like so I was thinking um, I, he, he, not to go off, but I, I get to skate with the Canucks alumni every once in a while, and it's just like it makes my cheeks just like from hurt from smiling and being all giddly, and um and I'm like oh my god I'm out here with Cliff Ronning and Dave Babich and you know Kirk you know Kirk McLean oh my god like you know, this is insane and I'm like these are the guys I grew up watching play hockey and then I realize I'm like yeah I'm like 3 years younger than I'm a year younger than Kirk McLean and like 3 I'm like oh gosh I'm like I'm I'm that old guy <laughs> not saying you're old but you're almost there you're only 5 years younger so you're getting there yeah <laughs> I'm already, the, the gray is coming and I'm not liking it already. Oh, well, nobody can see, but look at that. I've embraced it. I actually, I had to color it for a gig a couple of weeks ago and I was like, oh, I'm getting grumpy, old grumpy guy. Are you, are you finding yourself getting grumpy in your old age? Well, I think you call it grumpy, but I think it's just, I don't want to put up with stuff anymore. Right. Like, like I'm like, I don't want to put up with the BS. I think that's why I, a lot of the industry kind of, I just don't have time for it. Like, well, I, the, here's the funny thing. I do actually have literal time for it, but <laughs> I, I don't want to, I don't want to pretend, right? Like I don't, I, I always drove me nuts. I, I'd come You're home. You're an actor who doesn't I know, want it's to, my pretend. Job to pretend. But there's so much of the job that you have to do that you don't get paid for. I know it sounds silly, 
But in Canada, like if I got paid, we'd spread up friends. If I got paid friends money, yeah, I'll be your dancing monkey. Let's do it. Right. But there's so much of it. Like, you know, when I'm, when I'm on the set, if you break it down hourly, you're like, wow, that's, ooh, that's some good money. But when you spread it out over the life, life of the show, it's like, you know, God, I got to make this, you know, I got to spread this out here, guys. So there's so much of it you're obligated to do. And I'm not talking about just like promoting the show. We're sorry for running on, but, uh, but here, you know, but like getting auditions and, and doing the self promotion and going out doing all this stuff you're expected to do to get work. And then when you have work and you finish the work then promote the work, it's just, you, you gotta still put it on. You feel like you feel, uh, and so I'd come home from say like a press junket and I'd just be like, who was that guy? Like, it wasn't me. Like you feel like you're putting it on. Right. And you kind of have to, because if, if you just go be yourself, number one, you probably like me, you're not doing the talking points to promote the show. So you're not doing your job. Uh, and two, it's like, nobody wants to hear you talk about what the Canucks are doing last night. Well, maybe some people do, but the people that are paying you to be there, I'm not paying you, but you know, they so that, no, no, them, that's not what we, yeah. uh, are you Sorry? surprised that Tampa won the Stanley cup this year? Well, no, they had a heck of a team and they did it without Stamkos basically. That's incredible. You know, I mean, that's incredible. I'll and, agree and like, with I, that. I've, I've, I've heard some people say, well, I was bubble. It's not the same. I, they, how many games did they play not, like back to back? Yeah. Like the, uh, if, if there was ever a grind, like part of me wants to say that should be the going forward because you've taken a lot of the, the, the what made it, for instance, one of the beefs here out West is the travel. Yeah. You know, the Vancouver Canucks, it, the, t- the three years now that they've made it to the Stanley cup finals, they're battered. They're beat up. They've traveled back and forth across, you know, whoever the Western uh, representative is. is San like Jose just, or freaking yeah. whoever, right? Yeah. So any, anytime, you know, a Western team outside the bubble this year wins the Stanley Cup, that's a huge accomplishment. That team has got, you know, they're beat up. You just know they're beat up. Yeah. So the bubble thing to me might be the way to move forward. Like I know the, the owners don't want to hear that because it's money in the bank for them. Right. But if they figure out a way to share it, like I, you got to think you're going to see better hockey, you know, teams are going to be healthier longer. I will agree wholeheartedly on that. Like the bubble system worked, right? If you can expand it to like four or five cities, like all in Canada, like not trying to say, we should keep it in Canada, but with everything going down in the States with COVID-19, let's keep it in Canada. I think you'd have a good season next year. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. Can I go on to a little soapbox here a little bit? Go for it. <laughs> Cause, Cause here, this is always driving me nuts, especially as I got older. So when I was younger, I bought the Kool-Aid, you know, Hey, it's playoff hockey, man. You got to fight through it. Like, ah, la, la. I, I'm a, from now I'm, I'm done with that. I'm like, it's the only professional sport. And no, all of them let a little bit, like there's a little bit more, but it, it's the only press, professional sport. And it's not as bad as it's been, but it's still driving me crazy where you get to the playoffs and there's essentially a whole new set of rules. You know, like what was a slash? Ah, it's not, a, you know, yeah, it's not so much a slash anymore. You know, like it drives me up the wall. It's, it's like, if it's a penalty in, in the preseason, it's a penalty game seven overtime. I don't care. Like, I, I want to see skill. Uh, that's what I want to see. I want to see more of the skill now. It drives me up the wall. There, that was my beat. That was my rant. <laughs> well, there's so much more you could talk about because how, how do you feel about the new expansion team? The Seattle Krakens, the, the, the guaranteed rivalry of the Vancouver Canucks and the yeah, Seattle yeah. Krakens. Are you I'm expecting not, that so far? Well, I, self, yeah, as a Canuck fan, I hope it is a, a rivalry. I hope it does. It'd be good. That'd be fantastic. Um, I think, and I know they've they've done a little better, uh, you know, with the Kraken now. Um, but I, they, they, I, you know, if 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 Vegas won the Cup one of these years, I think it would have just been a travesty. Like they, they get well. I mean, come on, they they that that the expansion draft. But was, <laughs> that no, was I Batman like at his best, okay? That was Batman coming up with the rules on the fly. I know. I get it. Listen, 
you want the team to be competitive. Like you don't want it. You don't want them to fight, but Hey, and I know it was years and years ago, they weren't doing the Canucks or the Sabres any favor in, in 71 when they came in the league. They like, they, you know, that was just, it's just, I would be upset if I was any other. Is owner. the Kraken's the same way that uh, Vegas? No, I think I, it's not as good. Like I think, I think you can only lose one player, right? And I, I don't know these specific. I know it's not as beneficial as it was for Vegas. You know, they've toned it down a little bit. But the, the Kraken, if they're smart, they're gonna have a they're gonna have a good team. You know, if yeah. they're you know they're gonna have a good team. And it sounds like they're putting together together a pretty good front office. So they'll. They'll get. They'll pick good players. Like, if they want, they could have Thatcher Demko. It sounds like Thatcher Demko is going to be a great A starter something down the road. So, uh, yeah. my, my team's <laughs> not going to be back in the playoffs for a while. We're just getting decimated every year. So, who, who are you talking about? Who, uh, I'm the. Du- I'm a Ducks fan. In Alberta. Yeah. Shh. Shh. <laughs> shh. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Yeah, well, they, maybe they shouldn't have got Kessler. Yeah, maybe they shouldn't <laughs> got rid of a lot of people. Too. And hey, Kessler was a beast for us in in uh, in eleven. But um, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. I love. <laughs> hey, listen, no, listen. I I love Ryan Miller. Like when yeah. we had Ryan Miller, he he took a lot of heat. But I was like, no, he's like he's a quality quality goaltender, quality. And I know he's. He's up there. I don't know if they'll have him back next year. I don't know. Is he a free agent? I, I'm not sure where he's at. I don't like, think so. I think he has one more year in his contract before he's right. up for free agent. But my only opinion is they need to get rid of Getzlaff, and then I'll be a happy camper. Right. But they, got rid of, again, they got rid of Perry. He did all right. Don't yeah. Don't, we, don't, we don't talk about the, the, the dark year. <laughs> Um, Fred, I want to thank you so much for this. I feel like we went on like about a 20 minute tangent there. So I, apologize. Oh yeah, I know. I'm sorry. You can cut it out. You can get rid of it. Oh, no. I just put a little, put a little disclaimer. It's like, okay, folks, we're going into some, you know, pop in here. You might want to stop now. We're, we're, we're a Canadian podcast. If we don't talk about hockey with at least one of our guests per season, I think we are obligated to cancel ourselves. <laughs> Attaboy. There, Fred, I, just, I, wanna... I feel guilty now. We should have had a wobbly oh. pop. But next, next time. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Fred, yet again, once again, thank you very much for this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, have yourself an excellent rest of your Tuesday 29th or whatever day it is. Yeah. Hey, hey, thanks a lot. My pleasure. It was great, it was great talking to you. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Bye-bye.